much for having me. So I am going to talk about um, my study on um, sleep, self-management, and diabetes. And um, so my funding disclosure today, um, I am funded by the National Institute of Brain Research and the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Um, one is a um, Pathway to Independence Award and the other is a Bridge to Success Award. And the views that I present today are my own views and they do not necessarily represent the views of NINR or AASM. So this is just a little bit of an outline for what I will be presenting today. I'm going to cover, um, start off with sleep in young adulthood and how that differs from other age groups. I will then go into the impact of short sleep and how that affects on glucose regulation, how it impairs it, then go to sleep in young adults with type 1 diabetes, which is my population of interest, and then talk about a um, study that I conducted, the purpose, aims, and methods that I used, and then the results of that study, and then go through a discussion, and then some next steps based on that study. So young adults, um, and I define young adulthood as 18 to 25. So if we think about as adolescents are emerging into young adulthood, and um, so this is on the earlier end of young adulthood. So this is, you know, the time when this is a newfound independence, you know, we're leaving the um, parental home. And, you know, I, I think of the game of life, right? So we have either we can go college path, or we can go the career path. Um, and, and with this newfound independence, sort of deciding on bedtime for the first time, um, maybe going to college for the first time. And at that time, um, that short sleep is, is pretty prevalent in this age group. And also there's a social pressure to stay up with, with the peer group. Um, and about a third of young adults report um, habitual short sleep. And that is an, you typically, um, it's an underestimated problem because when we use actigraphy, um, they're typically reporting time in bed versus their time asleep. And that is coupled with this need to get up for work or school during the, 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 the week. And then on the, on the weekend, um, they're extending their sleep. And so they're, they're en there ends up being this ability in sleep duration. So over the weekend, they're extending their sleep. And on the, on the school or work days, they're shortening their sleep. So sort of this um, very big is occurring. And then there's also this later chronotype. Um, so there's this preference to stay up later um, that peaks in the mid 20s and there's also a delayed melatonin onset that happens. About one in five young adults have a mental illness um, and that seems to be, there seems to be a rising prevalence of mental illness in this age group. And suicide used to be the third leading cause of death in this age group, but it's now the second leading cause of death and that's from 2010. Um, it seems to be rising. Um, and Mental illness can um, affect sleep greatly, um, particularly sleep onset latency and overnight, and so these internalizing problems. And then the brain rewiring um, process is not complete until about the age of um, 25. Prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until that, till about that age. And there are three um, key uh, neurotransmitters in the CNS that play a significant role in maturation um, of adolescent behavior and into early um, young adulthood, dopamine, serotonin, and melatonin. And so um, dopamine influences brain events that control movement, emotional response, and the ability to experience pleasure um, and pain. And those levels decrease during adolescence and that can um, that basically affect mood swings, emotional control, and regulating of emotions. And then serotonin plays a significant role in mood alterations, anxiety, impulse control, and um, arousal. And then those levels decrease during adolescence. And then lastly, melatonin, as we know, regulates the circadian rhythm and the sleep cycle. And so the body's daily production of melatonin increases the requirement for sleep during adolescence. And so this sort of creates this perfect storm um, during this sort of adolescent um, transitioning to the um, young adulthood period. So uh, we, we do know that, for example, car insurance does sort of start to lower around the age of 25, 26. And when we also couple this with sleep deprivation, so this impulse control, this sort of increase in car accidents, um, this age group is sort of at this um, high risk of all of these things um, occurring. And 
when we look at Till Romberg's work, um, there are these individual differences in chronotype. There's this earlier melatonin onset for morning types, later melatonin onset for later types, and this phase of entrainment that's driven by the circadian period. There's a shorter circadian period for melatonin onset occurs many hours before they go to bed. And so chronotype, as estimated by timing of mids on free days, um, because the circadian um, system is driving the, the timing of sleep under free conditions. And as we can see here in this uh, graph, um, there is this age relationship from about 10 years of age um, to about a little over the age of 60. And so um, we can see chronotype on the y-axis, which is the timing of sleep on free days, is corrected for the amount of sleep loss during the week in this paper. Um, those who are earlier have earlier mid-sleep times, and those who are later have later mid-sleep times. You can see this developmental change from about childhood to adolescence and young adult young adulthood where there's a later and later and then a peak occurring in the mid 20s so you can see this sort of mid 20s peak happening um about 25 26 um and then males have sort of a little bit of a higher peak and then as as the as we you know get older and older we um that sort of levels out across the lifespan And in several studies, so these la uh, well-controlled lab studies, we know that when we restrict sleep, so to four or five hours, it does have a direct impact on glucose regulation and, and insulin resistance. So this has been um, well-documented in both those without a chronic condition. So we've taken healthy men, we've looked at women, um, we've looked at also those with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, um, looked at just type 1. Um, and we know that it leads to insulin sensitivity. It impairs um, metabolic endocrine fun function. So just from one or two nights of short sleep, we do know that it leads to insulin resistance. So we, we take these folks and bring them to you know, the primary care providers. They would be diagnosed with prediabetes just from these um, experiments that have been done. Um, so we're going to speak and then replicated in several other labs. Just showing um, a picture here of these, you know, um, normal sleep opportunity on the left versus the short sleep on the right, just from um, sort of an N of 11 age group of 18 to 27, um, just showing just the two nights of short sleep duration, glucose tolerance, glucose effectiveness, the acute insulin response, and insulin sensitivity. And then in the, the other graph on the right, this was um, poor sleep quality, so affecting the, the suppressing the slow wave sleep, having um, similar effects, um, not as significant with glucose effectiveness or acute insulin response, but insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance having significant effects with, with those. Daphne, do you know what they thought was the uh mechanism think so maybe this is it i'm sorry do you know what they thought was the mechanism maybe this slide is there oh of the the of slow the, wave sleep or no well even of the of, i mean slow wave sleep and growth hormone it also has leptin and ghrelin is there too and this was another study that was done um where you know shortening sleep duration also has effect on leptin and ghrelin um, hormones. Um, this was a randomized crossover study with two nights of four hours in bed versus two nights of ten hours in bed, and we can look at the daytime profiles of these, um, where you know, overall leptin levels decreased by an average of eighteen percent, where ghrelin levels increased by twenty eight percent, and then the, the ghrelin leptin ratio increased by more than seventy percent. And then in, in other separate studies, they looked also at, you know, how people responded in their food choices, their carbohydrate choices. And, and you know, the speculation was if the studies were to increase, you know, sort of the obesity profiles would also increase. And um, this was another um, study just of leptin. And as you can see, these profiles increased, you know, four hours versus eight hours versus 12 hours. Um, and so there's this clear dose response relationship that, oh, that was a sweet. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so is everybody clear about what Ghrelin and leptin is all about? Yeah. 
So leptin is the fullness hormone and ghrelin is the hunger hormone. I don't know if someone had a question. I heard someone. So, I mean, these are things that affect your appetite the next day, right? Yes. So, um, type 1 diabetes um, has been an interest of mine. I was a pediatric nurse um, in my practice before getting into research and um, academia. And um, so I saw a lot more type 1 diabetes than type 2 diabetes. You know, um, I will go through sort of the differences between the two um, in another slide. But type 1 is a heterozygous disorder. It leads to beta cell just and an absolute insulin deficiency. Um, it affects 1.6 million Americans. And um, so as I'm showing here, it, the largest con contribution is from a single locus um, here that comes from several genes located on the MHC complex on chromosome 6P23. And so this is an autoimmune condition. and what happens is are these beta cells become destroyed and then the body does not the body no longer produces insulin so they, they become completely insulin deficient and there are some some vaccines that have been trialed in this to try to prevent the condition from occurring and they are they have gone gotten all the way to phase three um, but the phase three trials have um, failed that was back in 2014. And hopefully, we can uh, make some continue to make progress on preventing the condition. So I know that a majority of folks are uh, familiar with type two diabetes. Just to differentiate the two, so type one used to be called child onset or insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, and type two used to be called non insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or adult onset. And I will sort of go through the differences here. And so we've re renamed these um, to, because as you can see, they're, um, they're very distinct. And type one can be diagnosed in adulthood and type can be diagnosed in childhood. And so um, type one affects 1.6 million Americans and type two affects 34.2 million Americans. So type two is more common um, and type one um, is less common. But type 1 occurs more commonly in childhood still, and type 2 occurs more commonly in adulthood. Um, type 1, as I mentioned before, is autoimmune, and it always requires insulin. So as I mentioned, it does uh, attack the beta cells, and the body no longer produces insulin. On the other side, type 2 is a metabolic condition, and it's characterized by insulin. They require insulin, so that's where the confusion can happen. Um, however, it can be treated with lifestyle modification. Sometimes people will have bariatric surgery, um, they, will, they will lose weight, um, and actually they can be treated without medications at all. So they may not need medications or just metformin or oral um, hypo, hypoglycemic agent. Um, so they're very different. So type 1 diabetes is not associated with obesity. However, on the other side, type 2 is associated with obesity, and the obesity contributes to the insulin resistance. And so if we can um, improve the obesity in type 2 diabetes, um, the condition can go into remission. With type 1 diabetes, it's a complex management, um, intensive insulin management, um, and with type 2 diabetes, weight loss is key. With type 1 diabetes, it's not preventable. There is this um, gene environment interaction, whereas with type 2, um, most cases are preventable. With type 1, there are insulin injections or there, are, or there is a pump. There, there are point of care or continuous glucose monitoring that, that are required, carb counting, healthy eating, and physical activity. On the flip side, type 2 mentioned healthy eating, physical activity, oral um, medications may be required, and sometimes insulin in some cases. And with type 2, typically people are diagnosed over the age of 40. However, with um, the obesity um, epidemic that's um, the obesity on the rise, 
we are seeing children diagnosed with type 2 diabetes now. Uh, so it is sort of that I, um, in terms of adult onset, that, that no longer applies. Um, so JDF is a foundation that um, funds research for type 1 diabetes, and it's just sort of giving you um, a little overview of efforts. And failing to discern between type 1 and type 2 um, unfortunately has innumerable consequences for patients. Not only does it render the CDC data sort of unreliable, um, but it facilitates misconceptions about enigmas about diabetes. It creates disincentives for medical funding, and it alters public health priorities. So while this differentiation might seem a small error, it has the potential to, to delay treatment advances and potentially a cure for those living with these. And also, you know, think about although we've improved type one over the last year, people with type one have a shorter life expectancy of by about 12.2 um, years compared to the general population. And so some, some efforts that um, have been, so there's a type one diabetes exchange that has started. Um, so to collect data just for type one and also JDRF has started um, because there is, there are a lot of, a lot more effort has been put towards type two diabetes research makes sense because there are more people with type two. However, um, we do need to focus efforts on cure research for type one. Hi, buddy. See you. Love you. So self-management of type one is complex, um, particularly with having the insulin, the intensive insulin requirement. And um, so if we can get folks on an insulin pump, it does make things a lot easier. And continuous glucose monitoring is another um, aspect. Um, typically with the two pumps, they're not and they don't work in tandem, but there we now have closed loop systems that are starting, um, also known as artificial pancreas. So thinking about sleep at night, um, it, it's very challenging for these individuals because they're monitoring monitoring both, and then having to now think about sleep at night. So I'll talk about that in a moment. So only 14% of young adults achieve glycemic targets, and that's a target less than 7%. Um, as you can imagine, um, so young adults actually have the poorest glycemic control of any age group. So adolescents, because they're still with their parents, they're under that parental control. They have better glycemic, they achieve glycemic targets at a better rate. And then uh, so even yet, uh, older young adults, like 26 on and middle age and older adults, they, they are actually achieving targets at a better rate. So I think it's just this college age, sort of just transitioning into the workforce that are at a higher risk. And um, glycosylated hemoglobin is the average of the past three months um, that's giving us these, these numbers. So as you can, probably another thing to point out is that has limitations as well. And this is a trial of the DCCT EDIC um, as an epidemiologic trial that's been going on for um, over 30 years. It's followed people um, longitudinally. And basically, the big takeaway from this trial is to maintain blood glucose concentrations as close to the non-diabetic range um, as safely as possible. And that's without having um, severe hypoglycemic events, because that's, that's a risk if you do maintain that range. And that, that prevents the um, premature micro and macrovascular complications. Um, what, what this doesn't account for, the hemoglobin A1C, it doesn't account for glucose variability. So you could take three patients, they all have the same hemoglobin A1C, but you could look at their glucose variability profiles. You could have A, B, and C patient or participant, and you, you look at their, their swings, right? So look at A, you, they have, you know, they're all over the place throughout the day. So they, they start off at somewhere around 200, they can go up to 400, they can come down somewhere six. So on average, they look okay, but but look at their um, their swings versus someone versus number uh, letter B, they have you know a little bit of variability throughout the day, and then C where they have um, oh sorry I skipped that they have a little bit of variability and then they go high um, etc. So it's actually this variability that um, can lead to the endothelial damage and then can lead to the macro and microvascular complications. 
And this is something that has gained or that has emerged in research as another important variable to look at, especially now that we have these monitoring technologies and can look at this. So I, I did a couple of integrative reviews um, looking at fatigue and sleep characteristics in young adults, and I found there are there, there's not a litter um, look at this population. And in my integrative review based on 17 days, I did an integrative review. There was, really wasn't enough to do a systematic review. So I looked at qualitative and quantitative literature. And I found that um, self-report sleep quality was associated with poor glycemic control, also short sleep as measured by even uh, self-report, polysomnography, and actigraphy was also associated with poor glycemic control. Less time in deep sleep was associated longer sleep onset latency, and a higher fragmentation index. And it was based on um, 529 participants with type 1. And then some studies had a group. And I did go up to the age of 40 because there, there wasn't a lot of literature. And the BNIs, as you can see, were, um, they did not have, sick, um, a lot of folks did not have obesity in the studies. And then they wouldn't see, um, in the type 1 diabetes group was about 1.8, which is not terribly high. And then when you compare both type 1 diabetes to match control, they have a poor sleep quality um, as measured by polysomnography, so they spend less time in deep sleep. They also have more sleep variability, and they have an impaired awakening response to hypoglycemia. So when they, they looked at studies um, well, actually, there was one study that used the um, hyperinsulinemic um, clamps, and so they would use, um, they would start them off at 85 milligrams per deciliter compared to the control group, and they would bring them to 75, 65, et cetera, down to 45 milligrams per deciliter. And when you compare them to the control group, the control group would wake up, or they would have, you know, increased epinephrine levels, they would have less time in deep sleep, but the, the group with type 1 diabetes would actually sleep deeper. And so the conclusion from that study was that the, the group with type 1 diabetes actually had an impaired awakening response, which, which is dangerous. Um, and they could you know, suffer from potentially fatal hypoglycemia. And so just, to, just a synopsis here, um, without chronic conditions, we know that the, there is an impaired glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity with sleep restriction. There's a reduced acute insulin response to glucose and impaired body weight regulation, and there's an impaired cognitive performance. And then in type 1 diabetes, there's a reduced insulin sensitivity and then a poor cognitive performance compared to same age controls when you look at the, the studies. And um, I looked at adolescents with type 1 diabetes for my postdoc. I looked at between persons um, associations with sleep and then um, it's sleep and glucose, and then I looked at within person associations. And I found that more overall glucose variability was associated within person with more sleep disruptions or poor sleep in the study. So um, earlier wake time or longer uh, wake after sleep onset. And then in the between persons associations, sleep variability was associated with higher stress, higher depressive symptoms, and more glucose variability. And then um, we also looked at circadian rhythm in that study. And the only thing that circadian rhythms were associated with were, um, so a more consistent rest activity rhythm timing was associated with fewer trait anxiety symptoms. And then more robust rhythms were associated with better diabetes self-management in adolescents. So those with a higher mean measure and a higher amplitude had lower trait anxiety symptoms. And those with a more consistent timing of the rest activity rhythm as measured by acrophase had lower trait anxiety symptoms in the study. This is just um, a picture of this um, between person study in adolescents. And um, we, so the, uh, on the graph here, you see um, five nights of data in a participant, and um, we the rest activity um, was so there was a sample of glucose variability in the rest activity rhythm analysis where he fitted the glucose values over the rest activity rhythm, and as you can see, the blue dots are the um, 
so sort of the normal post values then um, range and then the red dots are the hyperglycemia values and so see the the normal glucose values that are within range are are strongly coupled to the the um, rest activity rhythm so it looks like um, glucose ability is close, uh, close to the circadian rhythm here or you may need to explain what the uh, rest activity rhythm is. This is the activity okay, yes. of actual signals. Right. Yes, so right. you have here, um, and then we have the, um, sorry. So this is giving you like the cosine wave here of, um, so this is, this is night after night of the, the Meser wave and um, so this is the signal every every night after. And so as you can see, the but the signal between the two is strongly coupled. So this, this person, just, yeah, I was I was taking a step back because this this group doesn't look at this data very often. We don't use it clinically. And so the the, the height of these bars is the amount of activity and the intensity of activity. Uh, measured by a wrist actigraph. And so you see right. there are periods of activity and inactivity, which correspond about 80% to sleep wake cycles. And then your blue and red dots are the glucose control. And your green right. is a fitted, a fitted uh, model for circadian rhythm to the actigraphy data. So right. And, and you look at it in a couple of different ways. You look at it at what's the mean value, that is the mean activity. But more importantly is, is that what's it, where is its lowest point? And you see its lowest point is where it should be during uh, uh, inactivity and its highest point during activity. And then you look at that relationship. And what you see is this correlation between glucose values and this uh, mathematical fit to the actigraphy data. So this is pretty important stuff in terms of this is the basic science of, of this particular analysis. And I know that some people yeah. will soar through this because it's basic science, but this is what it is. This is good stuff. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, and so um, I'm going, this is um, the protocol paper for this study. So I have gone into the circadian rhythm data my current study, but this is um, the protocol for the um, K99 study that I'm going to talk about. So the, the main purpose for this study is to characterize wake associations among um, total sleep time, sleep uh, duration, ability, neurocognitive function, diabetes, self-management, and glycemia among young adults. And I did use um, ages 18 to 30 years as my definition of adulthood, um, type 1 diabetes, and talk about um, sort of how I, I ended up narrowing that down a little later. And my first aim was to characterize sleep using self-report, and I used care, uh, questionnaires and diaries and objective methods using actigraphy and glycemia, um, use A1C and glucose variability among emerging adults with type 1 diabetes over 14 days to capture weekend and weekday differences. And in the first um, sub aims, I explored associations among total sleep time, sleep variability, um, neurocognitive function, and the variables of interest that I just mentioned, and then looking at between person associations and within person and within person associations. And then I conducted a secondary analysis that I will present today, where I looked at um, the perceived facilitators and barriers for obtaining sufficient sleep in adults with type 1 diabetes. And this is the sleep self-management framework that I'm using, where um, my primary outcomes are sleep duration, sleep variability, and timing. And um, I'm looking at the relationship there uh, between um, that and 
the primary outcome of glu uh, glycemic control and glucose variability, and um, secondary outcomes of neurocognitive function, diabetes self-management, and diabetes quality of life. There is um, a reciprocal, I, my hypothesis is that there is a reciprocal relationship between sleep duration and glucose variability um, because I, I believe that short sleep leads to more glucose variability and also a poorer glycemic control. But on the flip side, I also think that um, symptoms of um, glucose variability and poor glycemic control lead to um, sleep because um, you know hyperglycemia symptoms, the osmotic diuresis that happens from those can lead to shorter sleep. So people can wake up during the night with those symptoms and sleep can become more fragmented and also can lead to shorter sleep. Um, Short sleep also has a direct um, impact on neurocognitive function, leading to poor neurocognitive function. And then short sleep can um, lead to poor diabetes self-management generally. So diabetes self-management being defined by, you know, needing to manage uh, insulin, needing to um, manage diet, exercise, et cetera. And then also short sleep can lead to poor diabetes um, quality of life. And then there are also relationships between all of these, so neurocognitive function also impacting diabetes self-management and diabetes quality of life um, as well. Inclusion criteria are here, um, as I mentioned before. I did um, only include those with type one for six months because that's to avoid initial, um, adjustment period. So as the beta cells are being destroyed, folks can still produce insulin during that time. So I wanted to avoid folks during that period. And then um, I did not include those with other major health problems, other chronic um, conditions or major psychiatric illness because that can um, impact sleep. I'm not currently participating in any other intervention study because I didn't want those interventions to influence my results. And then reading, speaking English. Um, because the tools were in, when were in English, I had, didn't have them translated into other languages. Um, I excluded those with a previous OSA diagnosis, those who were pregnant, because that can influence both sleep and glycemia, and then night shift workers. And then the setting, um, I recruited those from the Yale New Haven Health System during my postdoc. Um, I assessed 91 for eligibility who expressed interest. I excluded 19 from the chart, who six who had a diagnosis of sleep apnea on the chart, other six who had um, another chronic uh, medical condition, two who had pregnancy from the chart, and then five who had a major psychiatric illness. And then I screened 68 over the phone. Um, I excluded 11 um, who had. Uh, 10 of which had high risk sleep apnea with the Berlin questionnaire, and then one who identified as um, having, who was pregnant. My final sample included 46. Those who did not um, participate or who did not want, agree to participate did so because of the time commitment that was involved in the study, or lack of interest, or they were not able to wear a CGM because that was another requirement of the study. They had to wear a continuous glucose monitor. So for the study procedure, I um, needed to complete a baseline survey at the first counter, um, a, two, two neurocognitive tests that were investig so investigator initiated or delivered, I should say, um, chart review. So I went into the chart during that time to collect data. And then I started them on a CGM. So if they already had a continuous monitor, they would just, I would share with them how to share their data with me. Um, and then I would start them with an actigraph at that time. If they did not have GM, I would provide them with one and would, I would have them insert GGM at that time. And during that encounter, I would provide them a $25 incentive. At the second encounter, I would have I would give them a prepaid mailer. They would mail back devices to me. And then I would give them a $35 incentive. So there was a stepwise incentive approach. At the third encounter, um, I would conduct an exit interview and that was over the phone where I would share their sleep report with them. I would share the report with them ahead of time. And then I would them with a $40 incentive during that time. And also, um, as you can see at the bottom, there's a uh, red cap. I had everything um, in red cap. Look, I also had my daily sleep diaries. I could look to make sure they were completing those diaries. 
I could send them reminders if I noticed that those weren't being completed. I did not send reminders if completing them on time because I really didn't want to overburden them with reminders. <clears throat> this is just a overview of all of the measures that I used. Um, I won't go through all of these, but just so you have an idea, um, self-report sleep characteristics, objective, neurocognitive, diabetes, self-management, quality of life, and post control. So for the actigraphy monitoring, I use Philips um, Spectrum Plus, which uh, collects um, data in 30, I collected data in 30 second epochs, and it also collects data with the standard spectrum rate. Um, it has an event marker that they, they, they push the event marker as soon as they turn the lights out. And so that um, I can capture um, sleep onset latency, although it's not as accurate um, compared to polysomnography as the other variables. So we get total sleep time, sleep efficiency, sleep onset latency, wake or sleep onset, a sleep maintenance index, and then bed rise times, and then sleep variability I calculate separately. I use the standard deviation of sleep total times so like that gets at the day-to-day -day variability and then the mean square of successive differences of total sleep time as well. Glucose variability, I got that from the continuous glucose monitor. If I provided them with one, I gave them a Dexcom G4. Um, basically, a, a needle is introduced into the abdomen that is then retracted and the sensor, as you can see on the, the right here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, is actually the size of two human hairs. So the sensor that stays in the skin is very small and um, it collects interstitial fluid every five minutes. And the variables I derive, these are some of the variables, but mean for minus deviation, J index is um, the overall glucose variability. Um, and it basically, it does not have, it excludes severe and persistent hypoglycemia from that. Then time of change is 70 to 80 milligrams per deciliter. The low high blood glucose indices, this is the risk score. Mean amplitude of excursion, the wind day variability, and then the mean of daily differences. I'm gonna kind of, I know I'm looking at my time, so I'm gonna breeze over some of these. Hopefully people are mostly familiar with these. But these are the neurocognitive tests that I collected. The psychomotor vigilance test, um, basically is a 10 minute test. It gets that response time and um, that's on a device. And then the trail making test basically ask the individual to draw a line sequentially from one um, to the last number and then their time. And then the second, so there's a part A and a part B and then the part B, they go from um, number to letter. And that gets that executive function, mental flexibility. And it's a standard neuropsychological test. All right, so this is my sample. I had 46. Um, the average age was 22.3. I had 32.6% um, male. BMI was 27 on average, and um, pr predominantly was Caucasian, 84.8%, a non-Hispanic. And um, some data are difficult to collect on Yelts because they do report their parents' income oftentimes. And 50, about half of the sample were college students. But they, most of them, 93.5%, did state that they were able to cover, cover monthly expenses. 10.3 years type 1 diabetes duration and their A1Cs were 7.2, with 56.5% being able to achieve the same targets. So on average, um, pretty acceptable A1Cs. And then most of them used an insulin pump, 80.4%, or a CGM, 80%. And nationally, about 30% uses a CGM. Um, their total time was close to seven hours um, on average. And then sleep onset latency was 19 minutes. So we'd like to see less than 30 minutes on average. Their sleep efficiency was decent, 85%. Week after sleep onset, 36 minutes. The sleep fragmentation index was 17 and their sleep variability was a little over an hour. These were their glucose variability indices. Their mean was 163 time range, a little over 60%, and um, their J index was 50. And then these are their other variability indices. This is a sample report in an actigram. 
um, this was generated from the from a Dexcom, although we did use other CGMs in the study, but this is the most um, predominant CGM that they that we used and that, that I've provided. This is a picture of the ectogram just one day. And the little triangle at the top is the event marker. So they would push them when they were attempting to fall asleep. The blue shaded ring in the middle is the uh, sleep period. And then push the event marker again when they were waking up in the morning. Um, the black the black lines are activity throughout the day and the night. And um, also you can see here the, these are all exposure dates. Um, the blue light, blue light, red, and green light. So that the watch would also pick up on that. The actograph would pick up on that. These are some of the associations that I found. Um, so shorter total sleep time was associated with um, more sleepiness, daytime sleepiness, but it was not associated with um, glycemic control or any of the glucose variability indices or the neurocognitive function. The, the, the associations were not significant. Whereas sleep variability um, picked up more of a signal. Um, so the day-to-day -day variability in uh, total sleep time uh, was associated with more sleepiness. It also was associated with the glucose variability indice, the mean of daily differences and also a longer median reaction time in the PVT. And then there was also a direct association with a longer mean reaction time and less time in range on the glucose variability indice or index. And this is just, I looked at other sleep weight characteristics and um, poorer sleep efficiency, shorter total sleep time, and a higher sleep fragmentation index were all associated with more daytime sleepiness. Poorer sleep efficiency, a longer wake after sleep onset, and a greater sleep variability um, was associated with greater glucose variability, as you can see here. And then greater sleep variability was associated with poor neurocognitive function measured by um, the PVT. So it seems like to, um, more or greater sleep variability was more associated with um, glucose variability, at least in this study. It was a small sample and that is a limitation. And as I just look at a couple of participants here, this, per this person had high sleep duration variability, as you can see in the actogram. And they had, um, you know, minimum of, uh, you know, an hour maximum of eight hours. And you can just see the variability in their, their sleep patterns here. And then we look at their glucose um, variabilities also their time and range they had about 49 percent time and range their mean glucose was 198 and their a1c was 8.1 percent or as we look to see it was in seven percent this person had low sleep duration variability looks pretty deep in here and total sleep time was fine for minimum maximum and on average they're about nine hours but their A1C is 9.4%. So the thing that we missed here, they do have a little bit of a higher fermentation. They have a lot of awakenings over here. So this person could have been, you know, I'm thinking about maybe a sleep apnea. <laughs> they didn't rule out for sleep apnea, but they could have they could or another sleep disorder breathing um, issue going on, or there could be something else. Um, I'm gonna just talk through some of my qualitative data. Um, to perceive the facilitators and barriers for obtaining sufficient sleep. Um, I, I showed the young adults at the in their exit survey a copy of their sleep report. So I showed them you know, their actograms that I just um, showed in the previous slide. And then I also shared with them the recommendations from the National Sleep Foundation, you know, the seven to nine hours. I talked about you know, the sleep onset latency, what was recommended, and, and, um, and then I asked them, you know, what helped them, or I asked them to describe a bedtime routine, their bedtime routine, what helped them to get a good night's sleep, what prevented getting a good night's sleep. These were some of the themes that emerged. So on the bottom of this graph um, here that you see, these were the general uh, facilitators and barriers. So that I feel that we would find these in the general population. And then on the top of the graph, this is sort of the extra layer. So I think about this as like the extra layer of responsibility that they have related to their diabetes, the diabetes specific. And um, I used um, Granahan and Lundman's method for um, qualitative analysis and V was used to organize the codes. And so general barriers of sleep were um, stress or anxiety. So 
one participant stated, I have a hard time shutting my brain down. So I'm thinking about a lot of stuff and I find that it's a big thing that keeps me awake at nights. An uncomfortable sleep environment. Um, when there's like noises happening, if there is any kind of light, you know, flashing or just presently in the room, if it's too hot or too cold. Sleep hygiene practices, an example um, to think about. A majority of the young adults with type 1 diabetes perceive that electronic device use, such as smartphones, television, movies, et cetera, for entertainment was an important part of their bedtime routine. Half of them said that they incorporated that as part of their bedtime routine. They go to bed with a phone, they would watch TV while falling asleep, etc. But only 13% identify this as a barrier to sleep. I found that very interesting. Um, one person said, um, I guess like watching Netflix too much before bed, like losing track of time, but I guess like taking naps during the day and feeling not tired. And then diabetes specific delays in bedtime was a thing. Managing hyper or hypoglycemia. I think sometimes my blood sugar. I really don't like going to bed with it either trending up or trending down. So I'll off day up to make sure I manage that's okay. One trend that emerged, though not always explicitly stated, was a fear of hypoglycemia. One participant stated, and then I think there's there might be somewhat of an innate worry that it won't go down or it will drop down too far. So I think having a high blood sugar beforehand kind of hurts. And then um, equipment alarms. So not timing my eating right. So my blood sugar is out of range and then likely to alarm. And then there were also diabetes specific facilitators having a regular relaxing bedtime, et cetera. Um, you know, managing their equipment and that and those sorts of things. The discussion and implications, you know, improving total sleep time and variability are potential therapeutic targets. Uh, we still don't really know the causal relationships, but I think there is there is a reciprocal relationship, and we can um, I can maybe do some within person multi level modeling. Um, I um, my next phase I am building a self management intervention, and. Um, this is an overview of that. I'm not going to go through it all so that I have some time for questions. And I just want to thank all of my mentors for their support throughout this process. It takes a village. <laughs> um, thank you all.